In South Africa, this is a joint work from a global debate program on the Nature Science Foundation of China. So, uh, why, why do the land cover? Because land cover is very important for, start, for understanding the nature and the human drawing, uh, drawing force. And also, he is also very important uh, variable of uh, hydrological ecosystems. So, so, this is uh, very necessary to generated the high accuracy land cover. So this is why the land cover mapping is also the top priority in land, uh, land cover researches. But, uh, uh, but uh, at the current stage, some key issues should be answered. The first, uh, the first is how to improve the land cover uh, classification efficiency. For, uh, for example, before we do the land cover, we use the ratio, uh, visualization methodology. This is the two consumer label. Sorry? OK. And, and, uh, and, uh, and second, uh, how, to improve, uh, uh, how to improve the uh, land cover accuracy, uh, especially in the, in the region mixed with uh, shrubland, uh, cropland, uh, and grassland. For example, in here, this is some. Uh, this is the uh, land cover accuracy of uh, of grassland and uh, and shrubland. This is very very low. So, but this but this uh, category is very important for the dry land ecosystems. So, how to improve the accuracy is very very important. And uh, uh, and the third uh, issues uh, is like the almost uh, land cover production at the current stage is made is uh, produced by the optical satellite image. And uh, and the and the sun information uh, 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 is used uh, is used very very little at the current stage. So so it's possible to uh, to explore the uh, the rule of uh, sun in the land cover uh, classifications. And uh, and also and also how is the function like uh, uh, like the different uh, vegetation indicated in the land cover classifications. And uh, and the last uh, point is like this. How to get enough samples for the training and the vali and the validation of land cover uh, results? So in here, uh, so in here we uh, we select uh, a typical research site located at uh, South Africa, and in this region mixed with uh, shrubland, grassland, cropland, and the sediment. And also, uh, actually, in this region, the land cover is profound. It changed the profoundly due to the intensive humor. Uh, uh, home activities, uh, but but the change process is not uh, is uh, is not uh, uh, recorded well. So this is very important to produce the data. Uh, uh, in this study, we uh, we we used uh, uh, site A data. Uh, we totally used uh, uh, eighty one uh, eighty one landsite A data in this research. So this is uh, uh, this is. Uh, a uh, number of observation of NASA data in this region, and this is a uh, uh, cloud cover percentage. Uh, and, uh, and also in here, we used uh, 133 uh, Sentinel-1 uh, data to uh, uh, in integrate into the land cover uh, classifications. Uh, and, and, also, and also for the, uh, for the samples, for, uh, for the samples for training and variations, we used uh, uh, the existing land cover products to introduce the enough samples. So this is list of uh, this is list of uh, uh, existing land cover product we used. Okay, uh, 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 this is very detail. Uh, this very detail of uh, for a chart for the land cover mappings, and in here uh, we used uh, the Sentinel uh, the Sentinel one and the uh, Landsat eight data as uh, input uh, satellite images. And also, we used the mostly and the percent, uh, percentage composites to generate more uh, uh, features and input to the and input to the round forest cluster, and use this approach to 
produce the non color classification. And, and finally, use the, the confusion matrix to, to do the uh, accuracy uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is a uh, simple way uh, we used uh, just the stratified uh, sampling approach from the existing uh, productors. So uh, so here the uh, uh, the, the broad uh, the broad, uh, point is for the uh, is for the variation or is for the training and uh, ready for the uh, for the variations. The totally uh, simple way uh, we generate. Uh, 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 27,000 points here. Uh, and, uh, and also based on what the new approach, we generated 93 features and put the 93 features into the round first uh, cluster to, to do the non uh, for uh, non classifications. Uh, 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 in here, this is a uh, 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 result based on approach. So in here, this is a, a non-cover uh, distribution of uh, our st study size, including the tree cover, shrubland cover, grassland, uh, cropland, uh, and the vegetation uh, uh, aquatic, as as far as vegetation and uh, barrier area building up, like this o o only ten. So in here, this is a uh, uh, variation result. Uh, uh, the blue the blue uh, dot means uh, Mr. White, right, and the red dot means uh, Mrs. Wrong. Uh, so, in, uh, so in here, this is a uh, 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 detailed result uh, about uh, uh, accuracy assessments. Uh, actually, uh, actually the, uh, the overall uh, accuracy is 76.43. Uh, 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 but, but if we focus on the grassland, uh, cropland, uh, shrub cover, and the vegetation uh, uh, uptake, uh, we, we, uh, we can see it's, uh, the producers uh, the produce the accuracy and the user's accuracy is not really good. But like the water surface and the tree cover and the bare area built up and the spice vegetation also including the plant plantations is very good. So how is our approach compared to uh, compared to existing products? So 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 uh, the first uh, we compare the the overall accuracy our approach from others uh, from other uh, uh, products, we find actually actually this uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the overall accuracy uh, is accept, accept, is acceptable uh, compared to others. Uh, that's only uh, uh, below than th these products. And also we also uh, compare the uh, accuracy of uh, shrubland, uh, grassland uh, with others. And uh, and here we, we, we and here uh, uh, our result is also accept compared to others. So, so this means our approach uh, uh, is uh, uh, it, uh, all, all approach is uh, uh, available for these regions. And uh, and here we, we will answer some questions before why why, why do this work? The first uh, the uh, the self mission the self mission uh, is good for the non cover classifications. In here uh, in here in here we found uh, after put the self mission into the non cover classifications. The, the, the overall accuracy is improved, uh, especially for the corporate-lined uh, corporate uh, mapping accuracies. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, improve, uh, improve greatly. But some, uh, but some uh, classes, the accuracy is declines. Uh, and also here, uh, we, we, uh, we compared the different vegetation indicator, uh, how, how it impacts to the, to the land cover classifications. Um, but uh, but all, uh, uh, but but we found uh, uh, the the in, the individual uh, the individual vegetation indicator haven't great uh, impact to the final results. So why uh, why because because the raw uh, because the raw uh, indicator is uh, calculated based on the bunch of uh, uh, optical lens uh, uh, optical satellites. Uh, uh, and also uh, we compare our results with. Uh, uh, with the round, uh, random uh, sampling approach, uh, so th so this is uh, uh, so th this is the confusion table from the uh, from the uh, uh, random sampling approaches. So in here we can see the uh, the accuracy, uh, the overall accuracy is really good. But if we focus on uh, for if we focus on some more uh, uh, some more categories, the accuracy actually is very very low. Why? Why? Because based on the uh, random uh, sampling approach. 
uh, this project we are gener generated a much more pointer in, uh, in the dominator calibrator and ignore the no dominator calibrator. And actually, we, uh, if we, we, we use the same uh, uh, variation samples to one the result, and uh, actually we find uh, the accuracy based on the uh, round more forest is very low. Uh, uh, like, uh, I think the, the accuracy is uh, 44 uh, percentage. Uh, so in here we uh, we made uh, uh, really uh, really briefly uh, summations. Actually, in here in, in our uh, study size we based on the approach. I think this is a uh, alternative uh, approach to produce the non cover mapping, uh, especially when the region we can't get enough samples. And uh, and second, uh, and second, I think we should uh, uh, we should integrate the. Uh, the information from the optical and the sa satellite information together, so we, we can gen generate the more accuracy non cover data. And uh, uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, I think the okay, I think the last point, uh, 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 the last point, uh, the stratified sampling approach is much better than the rather more uh, uh, sampling approach to generate the good accuracy. Okay, thank you. Speaker is Rina from uh, Research Center for Ecosystem, Eco Environment Sciences, Chinese Academy Sciences. He, she will introduce his uh, her latest result on Africa savanna ecosystem. Welcome, um, Professor Nanri, please. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to be invited to this conference and have, have the opportunity to communicate our uh, preliminary results on African studies. And this is the first piece of work that I conducted for this region. And I'm very pleased uh, to communicate with the local researchers and uh, also very excited about the field, field trip by the day of the conference. So the title of my presentation today is Stable, Stable States of African Historical Ecosystems. Um, so regime shift is a uh, key question and hot topic in ecological studies. It is a, a structural or functional changes of ecosystems. Um, for example, grassland degraded to desert due to drought or um, grassland uh, shifted to shrubland due to wood encroachment. There are good cases of uh, regime shift. So regime shifts can be triggered by multiple uh, external drivers. So the key questions in this field of research, including identification of stable states, uh, there are tipping points, driving forces, and the early, early warning of regime shifts. So the identification of stable states is a first step. This is a um, very popular theory about alternative states. It assumes that the ecosystem have re re resilience and under certain conditions, ecosystems can have alternative states. And uh, environmental change or intensive disturbance can trigger a regime shift from one stable state to another. And also this shift um, can uh, is uh, usually hard to revert. 
There are some evidences from local or landscape studies uh, that indicate that BELMs have uh, uh, alternative states under similar environmental conditions, but uh, <coughs> very few continental or global still studies um, focusing on woody vegetation. So the empirical um, broad scale support to this hypothesis across a spectrum of vegetation types uh, still still lacking. So um, this piece of uh, work mainly focusing on um, uh, the African continent. So it's a continental level study. <coughs> we choose this area because Africa has a, an extensive precipitation gradient and has various ecosystems ranging from forests and deserts, uh, from <coughs> forests to deserts. So our main objectives are to detect the alternative stable states and <coughs> exp explain the potential maintaining mechanisms. And we use space for time approach. Um, it is assumed that at a given moment, ecosystem samples in a specific environmental gradient are prone to present a feature of alternative stable states. And the features with higher frequency represent stable states and with lower frequency have a are um, unstable states. So if you look at <coughs> the figure here, so this, uh, the potential value means that this ball is at the valley of this landscape, means are at stable states, so it corresponds to high uh, frequency of distribution, so the vice versa. Uh, we use land use land cover data to firstly separate uh, forest, grassland, and shrubland. Then we calculated the frequency distribution of vegetation cover for each of the three categories based on the VCF data. So VCF has three data layers, including vegetation cover greater than 5 meters, <coughs> less than 5 meters, and non-vegetation cover. And then we convert this frequency density to a potential value of, of uh, U, which is called a uh, U value. This is a data source we, we use, and uh, there are basically uh, 10 years of um, mean from 2000 and 2010. So these are the preliminary results. Uh, <coughs> this figure shows um, P, uh, U value of um, uh, U value across precipitation gradient and the tree cover gradient. So the blue dots represent the minimum value of U, and the, the lines are the contour lines of the, of the U value, the potential <coughs> values. So we can see that the trees are distributed within a precipitation range from 800 millimeter to 2,000 millimeters. A closed forest is mainly located in P range from 1,400 to 2,100 millimeters. But within the P range of 1,500 to 1,700 uh, in this shot, so there are two alternative stable states of closed forest and woody, woody savanna. And in the P range of 800 to 1,300 millimeters, there are two stable states of woody savanna and savanna. Um, we can also tell that 65% <coughs> of tree cover is the threshold or the tipping point uh, for uh, woody savanna and the closed forest. And 41% of tree cover is a tipping point between savanna and woody savanna. And this is a, a result for, for the um, uh, potential distribution of uh, p-value for grassland. <coughs> So we can see that grassland mainly di distributed within the P range of 200 millimeter to 720 millimeter. And in the range of uh, 300 to 600 millimeter, there are two stable states. They are uh, sparse grassland, sparse grassland <coughs> at uh, uh, approximately 40% grass cover, 40 to 50%. And uh, the dense grass cover around uh, 70 to 80%. So
So 62% um, of the uh, grass cover is a tipping point between sparse grassland and the dense grassland. This is a result for shrubland. So we can see that shrublands are distributed within the precipitation range of 200 millimeter and 350 millimeters. And it is different from uh, the result of forest and grassland. It uh, has a continuous line across the precipitation gradient. Uh, there is a sharp increase in vegetation cover around 300 millimeters that connected two stable states um, at about 40% sharp cover and uh, around 70% uh, of sharp cover. So this indicates that shrubland have two non-overlapping stable states and the regime shift may occur without a hysteresis is when precipitation changes. So what other um, controlling factors that shaping the uh, stable states we're doing our uh, analysis for the driving forces? We firstly look at the, the distribution of, of precipitation. <clears throat> so by looking at this figure, we can see that um, mean annual precipitation has significant differences among desert, um, grassland and shrubland, and savanna and uh, uh, close forest. But uh, there's no differences between uh, grassland and shrubland. There's also no difference between savanna and woody savanna. Uh, it means there are most other uh, driving factors are controlling these uh, mechanisms. Then we look at <coughs> precipitation seasonality index. We look at annual mean temperature. Um, we, we also look at altitude, fair frequency, uh, some soil parameters, and also grazing in intensity across the continent. And we did uh, some statistic analysis and for each of the uh, driving forces, for example, there are significant differences among uh, sparse grassland, dense grassland, and shrubland in um, uh, precipitation index. So this help is helping to separate the uh, three stable states of these uh, three states. Um, also similar to the other uh, parameters, uh, for example, here we look at uh, uh, fair count. So <clears throat> there's no fair records for sparse grassland and shrubland, but there is a, a fair count record, record for uh, dense grassland. Also, um, it has a, a fair count record for woody savanna, but none, none of it in, in forest. And uh, similar results for the other indicators. So to summarize, <coughs> we, we conclude that annual precipitation is a main factor that distinguish desert, shrubland or grassland, and savanna and closed forest. But other indicators, including um, the ones that I mentioned earlier, all together contribute to the separation of the alternative states. And this result helped to identification of tipping points where ecosystem may easily tip into an alternative state. Um, in the future, <coughs> we need to further explore the nonlinear changes of e ecosystem functioning indicators, uh, for example, MPP, and analyzing the consequences of regime shifts. So this piece of work mainly uh, based on the structural characteristics of the ecosystem. So in the future, we need to look at the uh, functioning factors. And then we need to construct uh, mechanics, take models for prediction of regime shift and their environmental changes. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
as in part of collaboration with my colleagues uh, from Chinese Academy of Science and then Beijing Normal University. So our main purpose for this, uh, we really want to understand landscape change, climate change, the livelihoods, and uh, see what are the impacts, the relationships, how the three merge uh, into each other. So desertification or drying is occurring in South Africa, and it's a major threat, it's a major challenge. And we need to know, we need to understand so that we can come up with useful policies. Because if we don't know and understand, we can't come up with a useful policy. In particular, there's also poverty in South Africa, and uh, there's always these programs. But at times, it's difficult to come up with strategies because we really don't understand the climate, the landscape, the livelihoods, and the ecosystem service uh, function. So our objective, Hongma has talked about the land cover, the land cover approach. We also need to identify the agricultural uh, dynamics, what are the drivers, what are the impacts, and also um, how do we come up with these adaptive, particularly the nature-based um, strategies. So this is just a map uh, showing the study area. It's close to the Zimbabwean border and the Mozambican border, but in the northmostern uh, part of South Africa, it's very dry. It receives um, little rainfall. It's also um, very hot, and there's also high poverty incidents um, in the area. So what was our methodology? Our methodology, the first part was the uh, GIS and remote sensing, and then the second part was the survey where we conducted uh, questionnaires we went into the community, we had 160 resp respondents, and um, this year we also added uh, some more 30 um, respondents. So what are the results? In terms of demography, in terms of income, we can see that um, the study area, the people are not really educated, they are poor. If people are poor, they tend to rely on the natural resources or on the, on the environment uh, more. The income is also very low. So what most of the people tend to do is rely on environment. Even if they are farming or if they are doing any agricultural activities, they are not reaping that much. And something needs um, to be done. From a crop and livestock uh, perspective, it's mostly subsistence. People just um, grow crops and also, you know, carry this uh, livestock, not only for selling, but it's mostly for consumption purposes. It's a uh, subsistence um, farming. So from a landscape change perspective, what are the drivers? What is driving um, landscape change? It's urbanization and agriculture. Some of the areas are changing. The small towns in the area are changing and also agriculture. Agri agriculture, there is agricultural uh, intensification, also agricultural um, expansion. And there's also huge soil erosion in this um, particular area, such that um, some people are abandoning their land. So in terms of the drivers, we divided them into four drivers. From a socioeconomic perspective, it's poverty, also migration. People are migrating from these areas to urban areas, leaving the women and the children to do the, the farming. So this is leading to de-agrarianization, because people are no longer interested um, in the farming because uh, you know, they're not reaping the, the, the harvest or the, the rewards. So in particular, the, the youth are de-agrarianizing. Um, from a political perspective, there's also the issue of land reform. The government is giving out people, to the, uh, giving out land to the local uh, black people, and this is changing the spatial land use patterns in the area. Markets and also legislation and also poor planning, it also drives uh, land uh, landscape change. For example, in this area, the land is administered by the chiefs or the traditional chiefs. So at times, people are given land that, you know, on the traditional or the, um, the formal planning, they are not supposed to be given. So there's that conflict between the formal planning and the traditional land use um, planning, um, so to speak. The tradition or the cultural beliefs, it also affects um, land use change. For example, the tragedy of the commons, no one owns the land. So there's overgrazing, harvesting of resourcing, resources, and also um, deforestation. Uh, my colleague Hongwei talked much about the land cover, but I won't emphasize. So this is just a map showing the carbon stock as a result of the, the vegetation that we find in the area. It's mostly um, indigenous, so it varies. In the northernmost part, you know, it's, it's just shrubland. And, 
there are, there are no forests, there are no trees. The forests are in this particular area, but what is common in this particular area, it's mostly uh, commercial farms. So from a cultural perspective, the area has got uh, a lot of cultural ecosystem service. In particular, there's potential for, 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 for tourism, there's also potential for scientific research and education within uh, this area. There's a lot of uh, traditional knowledge, you know, the people within that particular area, they know about their area, even from a climate perspective, they know that maybe if they are locust this season, it means that there's going to be a drought, so to speak. So these graphs just show um, the provisional and the regulatory um, ecosystem services they are. Uh, there's uh, little game food, but crops, they are there, but not as abundant. They are actually um, declining. There's also plenty of livestock and plenty of fishing, but um, this is a threat um, to, the, um, to the environment. The air quality is also not bad. It's actually good, but from a soil erosion or soil retention or soil, soil um, formation point of view, that one is uh, declining. From a climate change, we see that uh, climate change is uh, happening. Precipitation is declining. Likewise, the uh, humidity is declining. But on the downside, uh, what's happening? Okay. On the downside, the, 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 the temperature is also increasing. So what are some of the impacts that we have found out? There's a decline in uh, crop production, change in livelihoods. People moving from agriculture to other forms of livelihoods, migration, deagrarianization, an increase in malaria, change in seasons, also these extreme events. People are losing their animals, but people don't want to cull their animals. They don't want to kill their animals because from a traditional point of view, if you've got a lot of cattle, you're considered um, rich. People are also being urged to change their crop varieties from the traditional maize to sorghum to millet to rapoko. And there are one or two projects uh, that focus on uh, climate smart um, agriculture. So the conclusion is um, the poor people in rural communities, they are really affected by climate change and uh, landscape change. Hence, we need to undergo or carry out these assessments so that we come up with appropriate strategies um, and plans. Um, so our project, it's a, it's a consortium of various universities in South Africa and in China. Thank you. Well, merci beaucoup, professeur. C'est un grand honneur pour moi. de vous présenter les résultats de quelques études de notre laboratoire euh, de l'UCAD, laboratoire d'écologie végétale. Quelques résultats que je vais vous présenter qui seront complétés ensuite par euh, mon grand frère aîné, Daoudangom, qui va vous présenter aussi des résultats sur les services écosystémiques. Et donc, euh, le contexte dans lequel nous travaillons le contexte dans lequel nous travaillons ok, merci merci, vas-y je m'excuse Donc, le contexte dans lequel nous travaillons est assez connu. Euh, au lendemain des chasseurs qui sont abattus euh, au niveau du Sahel, euh, la plupart des écosystèmes sahéliens se sont dégradés, ce qui a eu un impact négatif sur euh, non seulement les écosystèmes de cette région, mais également sur l'économie des populations qui est basé essentiellement sur l'exploitation des ressources naturelles et le pastoralisme. L'une des, des initiatives qui ont été prises pour lutter contre ce fléau euh, sont le projet panafricain de la Grande Miraille Verte, un projet qui s'installe au cœur du Sahel, dans un tronçon allant du Sénégal à Djibouti. 
au Sénégal, ce tronçon de la Grande Muraille Verte traverse trois régions, Louga, euh, Tambakunda et, 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 et Linguer. Et donc, euh, c'est au niveau de ce tronçon que nos activités de phytorestauration et d'études de ces écosystèmes se sont basées. Et sur ce tronçon, la phytorestauration va utiliser plutôt euh, des espèces qui sont non seulement adaptées à ces écosystèmes, mais qui sont également prisées par les populations pour leur intérêt socio-économique. Ayant compris cela, euh, nos études du laboratoire ont essayé de comprendre euh, quelles sont les espèces de cette biodiversité végétale qui sont euh, exploitées dans ce, ce ferlo. De connaître leur usage chez les populations et de connaître leur potentialité nutritionnelle euh, dans cette zone. Pour aboutir à cela, euh, nous avons choisi un certain nombre de sites et l'ensemble de ces sites ont été choisis au cœur du Sahel, dans la zone de Grande Miraille Verte. Et les éléments qui sont matérialisés en rouge, ici, sont en, euh, les sites que nous avons choisis pour notre étude. Donc le choix de ces villages est porté sur... Euh, deux, deux, deux paramètres essentiels, euh, la composition ethnique de la zone, mais également l'existence de projets intervenant dans la reforestation. Et un certain nombre de méthodologies a été utilisées pour cette étude. Pour l'étude de la végétation, nous avons inventorié les lignes et et les, les, la strate herbacée à travers des techniques d'inventaire euh, phytoécologique. Des enquêtes ethnobotaniques ont été effectuées également pour avoir un aperçu sur les espèces et leur usage par les populations. Et parfois, nous avons fait recours à des dosages sur des fruits que nous allons récapter dans la zone pour essayer de voir leur potentialité euh, nutritionnelle. Cela nous a permis euh, d'aboutir à un certain nombre de résultats. Du point de vue physionomique, la végétation du ferlo se, se présente comme ça. En saison des pluies, nous avons une strate ligneuse qui est euh, peu dense et une strate herbacée qui peut recouvrir 80, 80 à 90% du substrat. En saison chaise, euh, la strate ligneuse est la seule qui existe et qui pourrait être exploitée par les populations et pour le pâturage. Du point de vue diversité, euh, les, la composition euh, de la végétation est la suivante. Les lignes sont moins diversifiées et nous avons inventorié dans cette zone 19 familles qui sont réparties en 27 jars et 42 espèces. Dans cette strate ligneuse, euh, quelques familles sont mieux représentées. Il s'agit des combrestacées, et des mimosacées et des césalpignacées. La strate herbacée que nous avons inventoriée est la plus diversifiée. Elle est constituée de 25 familles qui sont réparties en 50 genres et 86 espèces. Et parmi les espèces, les Mieux, les familles les mieux représentées, on a les poissés, les fabacés, les rubiacés, les congouvillacés, les amarantacés et les euphorbiacés. Et donc, les lignes les plus représentées dans cette zone et qui constituent en fait les espèces caractéristiques du ferlo sont le Balanites aegyptiaca que je vous présente à travers cette photo suivi de l'Eptadenia astata, qui est la photo suivante, Calotropis procera, Bossia senegalensis, qui est aussi 
l'une des espèces emblèmes de cette zone, Acacia radiana, Sclerocaria birea, Acacia céale et Adansonia digitata. Les trois dernières espèces sont en fait présentes à des proportions relativement faibles. La biodiversité des herbacées a été aussi dominée par quelques espèces que sont Zornia glossidiata, Alizi capus ovalifolus, Cinquus bifolorus, Dactyloctenium aegyptium, Selgia gracilis, Eragrossix tremula, bref, et les autres espèces sont représentées à des proportions, à des proportions relativement faibles. La population utilise en fait 53 espèces pour le traitement des pathologies que nous avons recensées. Et ici, je vous présente essentiellement les espèces ligneuses qui sont utilisées pour le traitement des pathologies. Et parmi ces espèces, nous avons Balanites aegyptiaca, qui est l'une des espèces les plus utilisées dans cette zone, suivi de Sclerocaria birea, Combretum glutinosum, et les autres suivent. Et les parties les plus couramment utilisées pour le traitement sont surtout les feuilles, les écorces et les fruits. Les modes de préparation les plus courantes sont en général les décoctions, les macérations et la boisson est aussi très utilisée dans les voies d'administration de ces médicaments. Au fait, les 53 espèces que nous avons inventoriées dans, au cours de nos enquêtes ont permis au fait, de traiter les pathologies, de 18 pathologies, ont permis de traiter 18 pathologies chez les populations Peul et Wolof. Donc dans cette zone, la population est constituée essentiellement de ces deux ethnies, raison pour laquelle nous avons inventorié les usages des deux ethnies. Et nous avons vu que la façon d'utiliser, la proportion d'utiliser les espèces entre les deux populations du Cherlo ne sont pas toujours les mêmes. Mais cependant, nous avons noté des niveaux de consensus d'information des usages plus élevés pour le traitement d'asthénie chez les deux euh, ethnies, pour l'HTA et pour la tra le traitement des, des plaies. Et ici, je vous présente quelques espèces que nous avons appelées des espèces à valeur ajoutée et qui sont reboisées dans les plantations de la Grande Muraille Verte et qui s'avèrent être des plantes à valeur ajoutée parce que les populations les exploitent pour euh, d'autres avantages socio-économiques. Le Balanites aegyptiaca est prisé pour ses fruits qui sont consommés le Sclerocaria birea pour également ses fruits, Acacia Sénégal pour sa gomme arabique qui est connue à travers le monde, Bossia sénégalensis très peu connue aussi produit des fruits qui sont exploités par les populations du Cherlo et dans lesquels nous sommes en train de faire un certain nombre d'études pour voir les potentialités nutritives et enfin Jusifis mori, Mauriciana. Notre laboratoire a fait un certain nombre d'études sur les deux premières espèces qui sont en fait les plus utilisés dans le sondage que nous avons fait dans le Ferlo. Il s'agit de Sclerocaria beria et de Balanites aegyptiaca. Et les résultats des caractéristiques biochimiques des fruits ont montré que ces deux espèces présentent des potentialités nutritionnelles très intéressantes suivant les paramètres que nous avons étudiés. Sclerocaria birea est riche en sodium tandis que Balanites aegyptiaca pourrait être exploité pour son sucre, pour son potassium et surtout pour la richesse en calcium. Eh bien, des paramètres ont été aussi étudiés sur l'huile d'amande, qui s'avère être aussi intéressant pour ces deux espèces. Et le profil des acides gras de l'huile de Balanites aegyptiaca ont été étudiés, ce qui nous a permis de comprendre que euh, Balanites aegyptiaca est constitué d'huiles gras essentiellement insaturées qui peuvent être euh, exploitées 
à plusieurs fins, notamment dans le cosmétique. Et ces tocopherols sont également prisés dans le domaine du, du cosmétique. Et ce qui a permis, en fait, euh, l'utilisation de ces tuiles pour la confection d'un certain nombre de, de produits, comme les shampoings exploités par l'Institut Chloral, qui sont aujourd'hui commercialisés dans le, dans le marché. Donc, à la place d'une conclusion conventionnelle qui résume tout ce que je viens de faire, je préfère vous présenter euh, ce diapositif qui, en fait, euh, a été euh, utilisé pour euh, ce résumé que je vous ai présenté. Euh, la caractérisation de la végétation ligneuse et son usage par les populations locales, c'est une thèse de Mme Houye Nyansen. Et, et tout ce qui est Balentes Aziz Siaka que j'ai présenté a été... Euh, un produit de ma thèse que je vous ai présenté et tout ce qui est capacité, euh, euh, qualité biochimique et nutritionnelle des fruits de sclerocaria biréae a été un master de mademoiselle, madame Awala Tirsen. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention.